Anyway, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about our ResNet, um, the Fat Man, which is the Fife and Tayside Metropolitan Area Network, and Janet, except I'm actually going to do it in reverse order. Um, because Janet's really interesting, the Fat Man's moderately interesting, and people want to know about our ResNet and then ask questions. So. Right, ever since the 1970s, universities in the UK have been doing networking. Um, prior to Janet being formed in 1984, there was the Science and Engineering Research Council's networks. Uh, they were predominantly X25. Um, they ran at anything from 1,200 to 2,400 board. And when Janet was launched, it ran at an astoundingly high speed for the time of 9,600 board, running X25 and the coloured book protocols, which predated IP. Um, these are fantastic coloured book protocols didn't survive the uh, switch from X25 to IP and indeed I asked one of the chaps at work and we don't appear to have any of the coloured books anymore so I couldn't find out what they were. Um, Janet was quite quickly upgraded to a 2 meg core and each site had a 64k access link. Certain sites had more than one access link. Sites in Scotland only got one. Um, it was 200 sites plus by the mid-1980s, and it was mainly HE's, Polytechnics, and a number of government-funded research institutes. Um, further upgrade in the 1990s moved it up to an 8 meg core with um, 2 meg links to sites, and it made Janet the fastest X25 network in the world. Um, that put Janet on a precedent of being the fastest network in the world, and it still holds that today. It's the fastest research network available anywhere. And in 1991, IP came to Janet, and the Janet IP service was born. All of the Janet uh, trouble tickets that go out by email still go out to the GIPS Ops mailing list, which is the operators of the Janet IP service. Um, the first network that people started hearing about on the news was Super Janet, because it cost an incredible amount of money. It was government funded um, via the Joint Information Systems Council. And Ukona was formed to operate it at the, the time. Um, they ran ATM and data networks both at 34 meg, and they had 10 meg switch multi megabit data service links to every site. And every site in the whole country that was connected went back to ULCC in London um, via a BT switch multi megabit link. Um, the Next generation of that created the MANS, and there was IP over ATM as well as other interesting things over ATM. And the European Research Network links were um, 155 meg synchronous digital hierarchy links uh, with a collaborative trial with BT. When that trial ended, it went back, backwards somewhat. Um, Super Janet 3 and 4, um, they decided they wanted their network to become resilient, so they turned it into a ring. And the ring ran around London, Bristol, Manchester, and Leeds. Um, and that's fairly much the way it is still now. Supergiant 4 took it up to 2.5 gig, and then later 10 gig core. Uh, 622 meg links to Scottish mans, 2.5 gig links to mans in England. Um, largely due to geographic limitations of how you delivered services in Scotland. Um, Supergiant 4 added further education and schools backbone interconnects and the, all the council backbone stuff now runs over Janet links um, and they effectively turned it into the government funded high speed interconnect which education uses as well. Um, Supergiant 5 rolled resilience back into the MANS. Supergiant 4 was funded not to have any resilience into the MANS and there were collector arc DWDM networks for Scotland and various other parts of the country. That's how we get our connection. Um, we have a, a dual connection to Leeds and Glasgow, and those are Verizon um, dense wave division multiplexers that provide us with uh, various services uh, via the Fat Man and Dundee. And the, some of the 
Some of these are just amplifiers, and some of them are load amps, uh, optical and drop multiplexers. So you can uh, pop services in and pop services out at any location. The northern part of Janet, from Leeds upwards, Leeds and Warrington. Uh, there's the CR links over there to HEA Net, which is the Iris Research Network, NIAN, which is the Northern Iris Research Network. And then you've got our cells, which are on Fatman, and then there's Abman up around Aberdeen. There's UHI, which is in Perth and Inverness. There's Eastman that has Edinburgh and Stirling, um, Harriet Watt, etc. on it. And then there's Clyde Net, which is all the Glasgow connections. And that goes down via various different pieces of infrastructure to the major pops. There's Glasgow, Warrington, and Leeds. You see Norman, North of England, on there. The southern half of Janet is reasonably similar. The red links here are nominally 10 gig, um, but they're multiplexes, so you can have multiple 10 gig links running across them at any one time. There are a number of places in London where we've got the peerings. Peerings generally in Teller City and Teller House. And then there's the other mans down in the rest of the country there. No, there's also an East Net and an East Man, that causes lots and lots of confusion. So I call things two smaller names. The advantage of all this add drop multiplexing is that you can make a virtual circuit from a university to another university, provided they can connect to one of these uh, digital multiplexers. And that's um, become quite useful with regards to research bandwidth. So if, if for example, we wanted to get a large amount of data to um, Rutherford Appleton or somewhere like that, we could actually create a virtual circuit at anything up to two and a half gig between the two sites, point to point. Right. The formation of the MANS. Um, the left hand one is the old Fat Man logo. We're not allowed to use that anymore. Uh, we have a part of the new Janet partner agreement says that we have to use the Janet branding to make it clear that the fat man is providing Janet services uh, we contracted to Janet to provide those services yeah prior to the man's each Janet connected site had a link down to the ULCC and as more and more sites became on Janet realized it wasn't going to be viable and back in the day they only offered a simple IP service so they decided that they would find partner partner institutions um, St Andrews used to lead the fat man and we handed over to Dundee because of the uh, geographical implications. Running the high speed links out to here, we're a long, long way from anywhere. And running resilient links to here is very, very difficult and very expensive. So the two um, links now um, link into Dundee in two separate locations on Dundee University's campus. That's a picture of the first fat man. And that was connected via the University of Dundee's 34 meg link and our 10 meg SMDS link, both going down to ULCC. And we made a, a link round here. That, that, um, that's actually a fairly accurate geographical position of it. At the time, it was considered that it would be uh, quite trivial to drop a cable in the sea and light it up around out the coast. But um, the risk was considered to be too great with the shipping traffic across the Tie. Um, Fat Man 3, well, we added Northern College for Fat Man 2. Uh, Northern College was a college that had a campus in Dundee and a campus in Aberdeen. And the uh, Northern College campus in Dundee connected to Fat Man and the Aberdeen one onto Abman. Um, the interesting point here is that the Scottish Man interconnects were formed with the Scott X Cross Connect. Um, and that allowed us to do some interesting video conferencing. Uh, that's not a very good picture, but um, there were a number of 622 meg links and there was a number of 155 meg managed services. Um, the big thing it gave us was uh, broadcast quality um, video conferencing within all the Scottish universities um, right back as far as 1996. Um, a few years ago, the world decided to move away from ATM and went over onto IP, which was a bit of a mistake, really. Uh, ATM had many advantages over IP. It had guaranteed in-order packet delivery um, and various other carrier-grade features that Ethernet doesn't. And you have to 
uh, tag an awful lot of stuff on top of Ethernet and on top of IP frames to get carrier grade features. Um, I actually have a KNET cell stack because I decided they were too nice to go in the bin and we'll have a look at some of the old equipment later. Um, Fatman 4, that was the first Fatman I was actually involved in. Um, we brought on a number of colleges um, from Fife, Tayside, Angus, and we brought over Lord of College from Eastman because it was costing Lord of College a lot of money. They had to subsidise their link because the link from Edinburgh out to Dunfermline was very expensive. Yes, Lord of College was in Dunfermline, don't ask. It was named after someone called Lauder rather than actually being in Lauder. Um, each of the universities ended up with a two gig giga channel link, but none, none of it had any redundancy in it at all. Supergenic 4 had no redundancy. And our link from Dundee went down to Glasgow, Warrington, and beyond. And there were a number of incidents where we ended up without connectivity uh, due to faults further down. Politically, it became um, unacceptable for the networks to start going away as much as they did. Um, and Fatman 5 uh, brought in a lot of resilience, as in the picture I've shown you. Um, and we've now got multiple links to multiple sites in Dundee, or at least we will have when the uh, nice men terminate the fibre that's going across the Tay Bridge. Our existing fibre runs across the road bridge. If you drive to Dundee, you might see a slot cut out of the road on the return carriageway from Dundee in Guard Bridge. That's our redundant fibre link being put in by a company called H2O Networks that will be in the news for putting lots and lots of fibre in sewers. I think they thought they'd get more stuff in sewers than they did between Dundee and here. Right. So... To get from Fatman to where you guys are interested in, which is ResNet, you have to go through our network. Our network has a 10 gig core with five fully meshed Cisco 6513s, which are great big chassis. Um, we upgraded from 8540 campus switch routers, which were entertaining devices in that they had an ATM backplane, because they were designed when Cisco thought the world would go ATM, and the world didn't. So every IP packet went into a cell, went across the back plane, we came back out of a cell. That's some quite good processors, but they were not, not the uh, fastest devices in the world. Um, I would have bought one, except they're very heavy and very big. And I didn't much fancy. Oh yes, we well, are. Yeah, we're using one on our test network. Um, we now supposedly have a twin two gig attached to Fatman. And we've got over 100 buildings connected to our core network. Most of them at a gig, very few now at 100 meg. And we provide redundant HSRP links into our network. And it's basically the same in ResNet. Um, ResNet, founded in 1996. There was a small pilot of users in New Hall, of which I was one. Um, New Hall was built um, with a full cabling system in as part of the contract and all there was a number of pieces of network equipment put in as part of the contract and I think there was about must have been about 60 or 70 connectable locations and Newhall computer room was one of them and we ran them on three three com ten meg hubs there's one of those in that pile as well I couldn't find an old 12 port one but there's a more recent 24 there. Um, ResNet actually became a service that people could subscribe to in 1997. And what we did is we handed you a static IP address. There was no firewalling. There was no nothing. You were straight onto the university network. Um, and we still had a 10 meg SMDS line back then. And Late at night, you could get all of it. Uh, and we used to install operating systems across NFS from Sunside in London. 
it was quite good fun. But um, back in the day, back in the day, you really did have to know how anything worked to get anything to go. Um, it was, it had about 100 users that year, and it was uh, 10 meg FMS hubs. These uh, three com hubs had certain rudimentary management features in them. Um, you could enable disable ports, you could um, do a number of other nasty things like turning off all the packets but leaving all the lights on, and other cool things like that. Uh, you can still do it on a Cisco if you know how. Um, and all the halls were cabled during the summer of 1997 as part of the Ericsson Student Connect initiative. Um, Student Connect was um, a, si uh, a system whereby students could make telephone calls from their rooms. Ericsson didn't really see mobile phones coming. And it really wasn't on their roadmap. They just didn't see it coming at all. Uh, in 1998, we moved to start using DHCP, uh, the network. Uh, was upgraded to switched Ethernet using uh, 10 meg and 100 meg 3COM switches. There's one lying in the pile there again. Um, DHCP, HP Net servers, that's one of them. It doesn't have much of its guts left in it, but it's a big box. Um, not the fastest things in the world. And there were a number of issues with network registrar. And the, yeah. However, back in the day, we were having to proxy very heavily because transatlantic tra traffic was being charged to us at tuppence a megabyte. Um, that was as the only way Janet could find to fund the cost of the transatlantic links we had at the time. They were incredibly expensive to run and our bandwidth bill was in the 140, pounds a year. Um, Janet has subsequently changed its funding model so that we get charged based on the number of students in the institution which suits us very well because we're a very, a very heavy user based on size of institution, largely because we're so research intensive. I mean, everyone says it's ResNet uses all the bandwidth, but the astronomers don't use a fair bit as well. And we've, we've got a number of collaborative efforts with other universities, large biological data sets, uh, remote data processing, all these things use a lot of bandwidth. So back in 1999, the first firewall was introduced. It was a venerable PIX 520. Is it still on the floor by your desk, John? Your 520 still on the floor. That was buried in the desk. All right. It's under a pile boxes, but it is there. Yeah. Probably the the reason it was introduced is because there was about 800 users on ResNet by this point and you were chewing up all the bandwidth. Um, we still didn't, we didn't have incredibly fast connects because quite a lot of the 155 meg ATM connections that we had was reserved for um, video conferencing and quite a lot of it was reserved for research purposes and um, you only probably saw about 30 or 40 meg of it as actually usable IP traffic. Um, the levels of traffic we were running back in the day upset the lane on land emulation on the uh, ATM kit we had as well. So that was subsequently upgraded. Um, most halls had equipment, or at least some. Um, we had a 100 base core in ResNet, 100 base FX, on rather dumb switches. Um, and we began a policy of flood connecting sockets. Um, and we had enormous problems with viruses and these sort of things because the core equipment couldn't isolate any hall from any other and the edge equipment couldn't isolate any user from any other. So every time anyone got infested with a virus and it was network born, everybody got it. And the amount of traffic that was generated was quite considerable. Um, I can remember three or four occasions where we actually just had to shut ResNet off and send out teams of students to go and disinfest halls at a time to reconnect them. Um, this wasn't a very happy place to be. I mean, so we decided that we'd have to turn ResNet from a great big flat network into a routed network. Um, so we laid a new single mode fiber optic cable into the residences because it wasn't worth spending money buying intelligent 100 meg equipment by that point. Um, and we ran uh, new Cisco Layer 3 devices which are 4908 GL3s until very recently used in our wireless network. Um, 
and it all became a routed network. And each each hall was then logically separated from each other hall. DHCP servers were also upgraded at this time to Sunfire 280Rs, still running Cisco Network Registrar, which is an expensive commercially available DHCP product, which is full of bugs. Uh, we still had big issues with viruses and worms because now everybody that thought they might get 100 meg could um, because the core equipment could actually cope with switching this amount of traffic. And we still had the PIX 520, which on a, on a good day with a following wind would push about 25 meg. Um, and it very, very quickly became overwhelmed if we had any issues with viruses in ResNet and there were still all sorts of great problems. I remember spending a whole day with an engineer in the exchange trying to work out how to um, reduce the traffic load going into it from there's that. Um, there's still an awful lot of 3Com equipment in residences. Nothing had been upgraded to a Cisco in the residences at all. And we just had a Cisco core. More recently, we started to replace the 3Com equipment with Cisco 2950G48s. Um, had about 1,700 users in 2002. And the next year, we took on management of the residence classrooms because it was a, a bit uh, like the Wild West. Some were good, some were bad, some didn't work at all. Um, and student support and IT services decided to take on these and manage them as part of the classroom system. So we put 102 computers into ResNet into each of the classrooms along with printing services that actually worked um, that were centrally quoted and that we filled with paper and we provided toner for. Because prior to that, um, each hall was responsible for providing their own and some things worked and some things didn't. And some halls spent the money they required on it and some didn't. Um, the firewalling was moved on to the Cisco firewall services module in one of our 6500 chassis in 2003 and that provided ResNet with an upgrade from effectively 100 meg connectivity to gigabit. Um, in 2006, we started upgrading the Cisco edge, switch, edge switches to 3750s. They provide virtual chassis technology and they allow us to isolate edge users from each other to a greater degree than the 2950s would have allowed us to. We're still using 2950s in locations where there's one or perhaps two switches because they're perfectly adequate in that location. Um, we piloted in-room registration in 2006. Prior to that, you had to pitch up to Botswind, knowing your MAC address, and fill in a form. We got lots of these MAC addresses that are supposedly PPP adapters, and all sorts of other things. Um, there, there were some online forms that if, if you had an RCR that knew what they were doing, they'd take you into the computer room and register you there and then you'd plug in and your machine would work. It was all done by batch updates, so you'd register and then you'd find out if it would work six or eight hours later. And if it hadn't, you had to wait till the next day to put a change through. Uh, in 2007, we moved over to 100% in registration, where you plug in UDHCP into a private range. The, you log into the Right, you do it into a private range, you get a dodgy DNS server that uh, redirects all your requests across uh, to our registration system. Um, you log into the registration system, the registration system wanders off to, to find out where you're connected and actually lifts your MAC address off the, off the core router and then populates the database for DHCP with that. Um, and that changes which VLAN you're in. So when you, when you reboot your computer or otherwise up and down the interface, it uh, changes the um, VLAN that you're in and gives you a real IP address that you can use to access things outside. That's the pile of equipment that went into ResNet to provide residence classrooms. I was hunting around for another image and found that this evening. You sort of threw it in. Um, 2007, we upgraded the iDesks to the current model. Um, put bigger screens on them, faster processors, more RAM, uh, supposedly more reliable. Um, to that, this year, we still have some holes with the old 3Com switches in. The amount of money that we take off you for ResNet does not allow us to 
uh, replace equipment at the rate that we would desire. Um, but we don't really want to take any more money off you for ResNet because we think it's a fair amount to pay for the service that you're receiving. I'm sure you probably think it's a lot of money to pay for the service you're receiving. But um, going out and obtaining 100 meg connectivity on a commercial basis costs you quite a lot more than that. Um, we're running the Internet Software Consortium's DHCP servers. This summer we replaced the core equipment that was Cisco 3550s with 3750s and that allowed us to stack extra interfaces onto the switches and put hot standby router protocol links into each of the residences so if we lose power on one of the exchanges you don't necessarily lose ResNet. Um, and we're working on a resilient link into our core so we can take advantage of the resilience filtering down from FatMan. Um, there's 3,543 users on ResNet as of now. I'll let you go and have a look in a minute and see how many there are. And basically, we're very, very nearly 100%. Is it 98, 99%? Maybe at .5, Yeah, they'll go. No. Um, the university took. Uh, a number of extra students that it uh, probably shouldn't have done this year and we've rented a number of places on, a num on lease agreements and we've put in infrastructure into those at the moment so that it will extend very slightly. Right, Student Connect. Ericsson decided that putting a phone in every bedroom was a good idea. We thought it was a good idea too because then people that were here could make internal calls to each other. Um, people that were here visiting us in the summer could use the telephone and we could bill them for it. Um, and there are various other reasons and it was a, it, it's a nice idea to have a phone in your bedroom that you can phone 999 from if you need to. It's a health and safety issue. So they didn't see the mobile phone coming and they charged so much that it was cheaper to phone South Africa from a mobile phone than it was to use ResTel. Um, and after they lost money for quite some years, they decided they'd like to pull out. And they came along and said that they wanted to sell us the infrastructure that was in the halls and the telephone exchange plant for a very big sum of money. And they, I said no for the equipment and stuff in the residences. And then they rethought some. And then I told them that it didn't matter, they could come and rip it all out if they wanted, because I'd have just got it recabled, it would have been cheaper. And eventually they gave us it. So we paid for the telephone exchange, bits of it. Um, Restel, we don't make any money from Restel. It's not one as a profit-making venture. So they, we, we charge you what we get charged for the calls, for off the GCAT tariff. So, right. So I don't have any questions about that or anything else.